Hello, my name is Dale Ekbaum. We're going to talk today about thyroplasty uh, and arytenoid adduction. The reasons to do a thyroplasty would be typically for a uh, vocal cord paralysis, paralysis, but sometimes for a paresis uh, or even a bilateral true vocal cord bowing. Uh, this will focus more on a unilateral thyroplasty for uh, a patient that has paralysis. Uh, also, arytenoid adductions, I do quite a few of those. Looking back at my practice, uh, in the last nine years, I've done about 125 arytenoid adductions to about 125 thyroplasties. So I'm about 50-50. Not everyone in the country does that, but I feel like it's very nice to stabilize the arytenoid. And I use it in cases where there's any posterior glottic gap present and any uh, vagal, high vagal injury is another reason to use it um, since it can improve swallowing uh, function. So he here's our setup, a quick look at the setup, and then now we're um, uh, placing a pledge. I use 4% cocaine typically, place this in the nose on both sides, give it a little bit of time, and then we inject the neck. The neck, um, uh, we make a horizontal skin crease, and that would follow a horizontal skin crease, and the incision is around five centimeters typically. You can be a little shorter if it's just thyroplasty, but with an AA, you need to do that. You cross the midline by about a centimeter, and then you go down uh, to the SCM uh, anterior border for your incision. Here we're putting in a flexible scope, and uh, we do this with a patient somewhat awake. They're sedated at this point, and then uh, we have it suspended up above. We prep and drape, and then we uh, place a drape over the uh, uh, over the chin to separate the scope from the uh, incision. And um, typically, our our uh, techs and nurses really help with this part too. Here's the final draping or clamping it up high so that uh, it's a um, it stays up above the patient, doesn't fall on the patient's face. Some patients get a little claustrophobic about this, so I, I talk to them beforehand uh, in detail about this. So here's the, the final prep, and then uh, basically uh, uh, laying the final uh, portion of the blue drape over. Again, our uh, techs and nurses should be able to help with this. That's the final look at it. Now we make our incision. Again, about a five centimeter incision, we just crossed midline, and then, uh, and then we're going right through our platysma layer here. I uh, use double pronged skin hooks and elevate sublatysmal flaps uh, superiorly and inferiorly. Self retaining uh, instruments here as our retractors. You can use fish hooks and other things, but it's tricky because you can't um, suspend the fish hooks uh, uh, as well as you could, and so that's why we use self retainer. Here I'm cutting through uh, one of the strap muscles, uh, typically the sternohyoid strap musculature there. Um, we often have to do that in order to do an arytenoid adduction. You do not need to do that portion if you are doing a thyroplasty alone. Uh, then I use the Shaw blade to remove um, all the tissue, especially at the oblique line, it gets stuck down. The kidney here showing the posterior border of the arytenoid and allowing us to see where the um, uh, where the arytenoid was. Now I'm making my, my measurements. Once I get to the back border of the, thy of the thyroid cartilage, I go back to the front, make measurements, and for a, uh, a lady, it's five millimeters back from midline. For a guy, it's seven millimeters back from midline, typically. The windows are 10 by 13 for a woman. And, uh, I'm sorry, five by 10 for a woman and five by 13 for a guy. Our line there is the or the top of the um, uh, uh, vocal folds are. And we go posterior to the inferior tubercle and go up the same half distance typically for a woman. It's 
14 total, so half that's seven. You go up seven up front and seven just posterior to the inferior tubercle, and then you make your window. That's a five by 10 millimeter window in this person. And, uh, and again, uh, that's five millimeters back from the front, five millimeters in width, 10 millimeters in length. In a man, it's 13 millimeters in length. Here we're going back down to do the arytenoid uh, portion. And we're starting to dissect just a portion of this out. You do want to cut through the uh, perichondrium back here. And then we measure that length. And also um, measure up about a centimeter or just under that. You want to leave a strut in between what you're taking out with your garrisons. So that's about a centimeter from top to bottom. And then you start using your garrisons to remove the uh, thyroid cartilage and the inner perichondrium comes out with this too. All right, so we're still um, removing a portion of this uh, posterior region. There's our piriform pooching out. And we can have the patient either, uh, if they're awake, they can puff out their cheeks, but most of the time they're we have them sleeping for this portion, and then they just uh, um, are doing the deep breathing with sleeping and partial obstruction, a little snoring is actually nice to see the piriform pop out back and forth. Here we're spreading between the piriform and the muscular process. We find the muscular process. We push the piriform superior and posterior, usually with a um, some sort of retractor and then you throw your stitch around the muscular process, typically from posterior to anterior. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, sometimes you can go the opposite direction from anterior to posterior, but then you have to watch out you're not uh, putting a hole through your piriform sinus. And then once you get one stitch, you try to throw one more. You don't want to wrap around the entire arytenoid because that won't rotate it well then. What you want to do is just wrap around just the muscular process portion. So you go through the muscle with your stitch, uh, with your suture, and then just into cartilage. And then you take that um, around, and sometimes you have to um, tighten up the uh, needle actually make that stitch or make that throw. And then you get those out of the way so you don't drill those and you're basically drilling your window now. Typically use a diamond drill, four, four diamond in width. So we go from the anterior aspect posteriorly and uh, lots of irrigation. You can uh, start to see the muscle shining through there. Then pretty soon the, the inner table is gone as well. We're, we make sure we can get the corners. It always bleeds a bit in there. You use bipolar. You want to make sure you have a five millimeter width window. You have a small strut in the inferior portion and then uh, uh, bipolar what you need to from the inside. Then you elevate. Here's my uh, hockey stick elevator, one of my favorite instruments. You're elevating posteriorly, inferiorly, aggressively, less aggressively, superior and anterior. We're looking at the screen now. We're pushing at different parts of the vocal cord. There I'm pushing in at the vocal process along the sweet spot. You can see how that left cord pushes in nicely. That's right where you want to push. That's the point of maximal medialization. Typically in a, in a, uh, a woman, this is us carving, in a woman it's anywhere between uh, five and six millimeter depth typically, and for a guy it's, it's, um, it's uh, six or seven millimeter depth. And you want that push to be just anterior to the vocal process. So we draw out what we want to do for this uh, uh, patient, and it happened to be a seven millimeter depth, seven millimeters back from the anterior aspect of the window was where, and that's the window, the 10 right there. And the whole length of the implant needs to be 13 because you need a posterior uh, overhang there to hook within the window. Here's our silastic implant. I use a Meterville system, a uh, preformed implant, although it's not totally formed because we have to we have to cut a major portion of this. Um, 
the implant uh, has a more inferior push. And so I like to get not just an inferior push, but an, a mid push, a, a mid window push too. So I like to get a fairly sizable implant. I'll often take it from the back of the implant and then uh, uh, as big of an implant as I can get. But in this case, I measured, um, I measured at, at about seven or eight millimeter depth and then I go in front of that seven millimeters again and that's my anterior uh, portion and then I measure posterior to that again 13 millimeters which is the length of the implant of the implant in a woman for most guys the implant window is 13 millimeters and so the length needs to be 16 millimeters so it's longer in men because most of the time the push in, in a guy will be uh, at 10 to 13 millimeters back in the window versus a woman, it's anywhere between three and eight millimeters back from the anterior aspect of the window. In this, per, in this lady, it happened to be seven uh, uh, millimeters back. Here's our whole window we're measuring it now again. It's 13 millimeters in length. The, the greatest uh, or the point of maximal medialization, again, will be at seven millimeters back and we'll be in the mid inferior portion of the window. So this is how we hold the implant and then we make our initial cut um, with a fresh 15 blade, or actually a fresh 10 blade here. Straight down anteriorly, typically we go to zero millimeter height, uh, height anteriorly, but you don't get that on your first time. Uh, it's okay to just leave a little bit. Uh, sometimes we leave two or three millimeters anteriorly. But most people don't need much push anteriorly. And then uh, posteriorly, you need basically zero at the very posterior extent. Again, I start with a, a 10 blade here. It's all, always fresh blades. And I next cut off the edges. Use a 10 blade, kind of rock that back and forth and just pop that edge right off. I take about a third of the edge. So I leave two thirds of the edge because you do want some edge seems to be left here. And then take the corners, the four corners here. <laughs> so these are the four corners removed and then uh, we measure the height. I take that height down to seven millimeters depth. That's a little large for uh, a lady, but typically that's, that can work. Here we're taking the four edges, see that down to each corner. So instead of the uh, superior inferior edges, now these are kind of the angled edges, we call them. And then I start carving off um, to make the uh, uh, inferior and, and superior edges nice and thin. Superly, you want no push at all. This will give you a very strained voice if you have any of that. So we carve and remove this uh, superior edge and almost scoop that out superiorly. So we have no push superiorly and all the push on the implant is going to be mid window and inferior window. Take it off anteriorly a bit more and then we're measuring back. We like what we're seeing about seven millimeters back and about seven, six or seven millimeters up uh, for depth. Finishing the uh, implant at the end here. So last, and this is an eight, uh, 15 blade again to do, to do the majority of the uh, fine work. Then we take the implant off and we have to uh, fit this 13 millimeter implant into the window. So we have to make, and the window's 10 millimeters in size in this patient. So we take off three millimeters posteriorly. Make sure this is posteriorly instead of anteriorly. Otherwise you gotta carve a whole new window. And there's our window. So we go back to the thyroplasty, and we have to pass the uh, uh, sutures, the uh, retinoid adduction sutures first. So we pass that through the window. We have a nice strut that we've been able to leave posteriorly. And then that comes out, and then we go reach for the next one, typically with a mosquito or some instrument just to grab the uh, suture. Pull that through into your window, 
but of course you're not going to leave that coming out of the window. You've got to go under that window and, uh, um, and first we're testing it as well here. So I'm pulling anteriorly, testing to see if, the, if I like the arrhythmia movement, which I do. And then you go just out front through the cartilage uh, uh, anteriorly. And then the second sutra will be through the cricothyroid ligament, the thick part of the ligament. And then that does not move. And basically, you, you don't tie that yet, but you will tie that in the end. You put the implant in first. And the implant kind of goes around the suture, it's fine. You're tying it down in a minute here after you get the implant in. Take some pressure to push the implant in. The patient is awake at this point still. And so uh, you talk to them, you talk them through it and say, this is a little bit of pressure going in, but I, I always check the voice before I put the implant in and then after I put the implant in because I want to see what we're looking for from the voice standpoint. Then we tie down our retinoid adduction stitch. This is, uh, Dr. Netterville used a just loose technique. Dr. Marigos used just, just snug. So um, uh, I, I've done quite a few of these now and, and I like just nice, just, just snug and not too tight. You never want this uh, to be a tight stitch because then you can overdo it and give yourself a pressed voice. So I make a surgeon's knot first, and then I listen to the voice, pull up on the surgeon's knot. Once I find what I like, I, I pull, put that down and throw my sutures around it. So that's how I test the voice. The patient has to be completely awake. I take off the excess implant there. We always pull the implant back up against the uh, uh, wall of the thyroid cartilage. You don't want to push that in anteriorly. And then uh, rinse it out. And, uh, and then the, basically the procedure is just about done. I, I always leave a drain in for my uh, arytenoid adductions, uh, but I do only occasionally for my thyroplasties. My thyroplasties often are outpatient if they don't have a drain in, especially. Uh, you don't have to do even close to the amount of dissection. Of course, the thyroplasty, you don't even have to dissect off the oblique line. You just uh, put your implant in and and make your measurements. And then of course we're bringing the uh, sternohyoid muscle together again, mattress uh, suture and vicral. Tie that down nicely. <clears throat> And then I uh, suture the uh, straps together in the midline. I do like to have a portion of the drain underneath the straps and a portion above, but I don't like the end of the drain to be sitting at the piriform or any location like that. So that's kind of more superficial. And then we take our platys, and uh, you can do this in different, different approaches. You can just do the platys and then a second layer at the, the subcutaneous or um, or you can, uh, you can do this well. You can take both subcutaneous uh, fat and platys together. Do the final uh, uh, sutures here. And then I, I like to uh, use Dermabond on the skin if it's coming together well. If it's not, a, su uh, a subcuticular suture is nice. I also use like monocryl instead of vicryl for this portion here, um, subcutaneous and even platys, uh, just because of Occasionally, we see a spinning of the vicryl sutures through, whereas we don't see that as much with monocryl. Here's our uh, dermabond. You try to have it nice and dry so you don't get any blood uh, pooling up, so it looks very nice at the end for the patient. And I typically don't wrap the neck unless I'm a little concerned about some oozing, then I might do that for a thyroplasty if I don't have a drain in place. That's the end. Um, Thanks for uh, listening in, and I hope you learned some good things. I look forward to teach you more in the OR.